Okay, we're going to get started with our last talk of our plenary session, which will be given by Professor Anna Arias. And I'd like to give a brief introduction to Professor Arias. Anna Arias received her PhD in physics from the University of Cambridge in England in 2001. And prior to that, she received her master's and bachelor's degree in physics from um, the Federal University of Paraná in Curitiba, Curitiba, Brazil, in 1997 and 1995, respectively. Uh, she joined Berkeley in our ECS department in 2011. But prior to that, she, um, she worked in industry. She was the manager of the printed electronic devices area and a member of research staff at PARC, uh, Xerox PARC. She went to PARC in 2003 from another company in Cambridge, which, was called, which is called Plastic Logic. And that's, in that company, she led the semiconductor group. Her research at Berkeley and her research group focuses on the use of electronic materials processed from solutions in flexible electronic systems. She uses printed, printing technologies to fabricate flexible large area electronic devices and sensors. She's the co-founder of Ink Space Imaging, a company that aims to commercialize flexible MRI coils for pediatric patients. Please join me in welcoming Anna. Thank you, Claire. Is this working? Okay. Uh, thank you, Claire, uh, for the introduction, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Um, happy birthday to Ix. Uh, 50 years is a good age. I'm turning 50 this year too, so, you know, it's definitely an age that makes you think about what you do going forward, take uh, careful steps, healthy steps. So today, um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about uh, a journey that I have taken uh, here um, at UC Berkeley. Uh, with my colleague, Ms. Mickey Lustig, who is here watching me talk. He will correct me later um, <clears throat> about uh, what we have done together uh, to create uh, flexible um, MRI coils. So uh, first, uh, what does my group do? We work on printed, printed flexible electronics. Um, a lot of my group has uh, been working on medical devices per se, mostly medical devices that have different form factors such that it can fit the body very well and, um, and take data with uh, better accuracy uh, just because it's uh, in close proximity. Uh, most of the time, what uh, the students working with me are doing is they are figuring out how these materials work, how to process the materials such that they give reliable performance, and um, studying uh, how transport uh, of charges, uh, either electrons or ions, uh, occurs in this type of semiconductors since um, we are not uh, working with conventional electronics. So um, 12 years ago, almost exactly, I gave a talk at uh, the faculty lunch, which we have on Mondays. And, um, and that's where the story that I'm going to tell you um, started. So the outline of my talk is, uh, OK, first I'll try to tell you what the MRI problem is through what I learned throughout these uh, 12 years. Um, the research journey first, uh, how to new faculty um, get together with their perspective areas uh, to create this area. And um, the surprisingly amazing results that we had, which we were surprised at every step of the way. And, um, and that's what kept us going. How we built the, the business case. And I'll try to give you some flavor of how, how it is to work with students where you're mentoring them, they're learning how to do research, but then there's also this business that um, they could be uh, part of um, in creating. And uh, so basically it's just a, a, a summary of the 12 years of learning that I had uh, by being a professor here. So it always starts like this. I am giving this talk 
Um, I was a little nervous. I'm not an electrical engineering uh, or a computer scientist, and I, I ended up here as a physicist after being in industry. So I give a talk and I tell them how printed electronics would be great, especially for medical devices, which was what I wanted to do. And then this guy comes running, running, crosses the road, Anna, 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 do you think you could print coils? Uh, and, and I said, <laughs> what are coils? So, um, yes, so this was the beginning. This guy uh, that drew this picture also of our beginning is Mickey. And um, um, Mickey had been here for one year. I had been here for two weeks. And we start talking about, can, can coils be printed? So to answer my question that I had to Mickey, what are coils from my point of view? It's a loop, it's a metal loop. And in that uh, metal loop, you have two capacitors, uh, sometimes three. The capacitors have different jobs. One is to uh, tune to the, the impedance of the system. The other will tune this loop, this antenna, uh, to the magnetic field frequency that you have in the, in the scanner. So to me, that was good enough to start trying. Even though I didn't have uh, the knowledge of all the other parts, I trusted my, my, my colleague. Um, I had that knowledge. So, I didn't have students, I didn't have a lab, um, and I started looking at uh, materials that uh, we could use that um, would be uh, valuable uh, for the MRI case. Well, I also had to learn what, uh, what's MRI all about. I think most people um, know uh, what magnetic resonance imaging is, and, um, and lots of us have been uh, to an MRI uh, by now, and um, typical aspects of, uh, of the experience are it's cold, it's noisy, it's long, it's uncomfortable, it's scary. And um, one of the contributing scaring factors um, are the coils, which um, are heavy and are on top of the patient, as you can see here. So these coils, which are antennas, they are capturing the, a signal due to an RF field. Um, while you are inside of the big tube, that uh, is also uh, giving a, a magnetic field. So you need both uh, for the image. So people that go to get an MRI don't look happy like in this picture. Uh, but um, there are some aspects of the coil that are important uh, and we try to fix. Uh, one of them, this coil is hanging out of the body. That means that you have antennas that are not uh, really uh, on top of the body where you want to image. And we started talking to uh, coil engineers because Mickey was not working on coils either when we started this. And we talked uh, to many people that were designing coils, and we said we want to change the way coils are done. And uh, it was very clear that they were very rigid on what coils uh, should look like. And the mindset was, you have to have these electronics, they're very expensive, it's the only way it will work, and it has to last for 20 years, and if it doesn't last for 20 years, it's useless. So this is the way that you have to design coils. And we were like, well, that's not quite what we're thinking about. And, and really, um, most of the time, uh, one solution doesn't fit everyone. So, um, we, we decided to take the problem a little bit differently. And we like, uh, well, we have many cartoons here how to, how to show uh, the problem of MRI. And the problem of this design of coils is that there is one, one coil or one size fits all. And um, it doesn't matter if you are a strong, tall human or a child, the coil that is available in the hospital um, has been designed with the same mindset and same size, same weight. So for children, um, MRI um, coils was uh, even a bigger problem than, uh, than for adults. 
Then I learned a little bit more about how these antennas uh, work and uh, what Miki was doing was looking at ways of accelerating image acquisition to solve one of the problems, which is it's too slow. And in order to apply these techniques of uh, acceleration in imaging acquisition, the coils, you need many coils. You need an array of coils. And of course, if you have antennas that are not on top of the, the person that you want to image and these, un these antennas are actually outside of the body, then you're picking up noise um, and not uh, good data. Therefore, you throw away some of the coils that you have in your antenna and acceleration is also thrown away from that uh, skin. On top of uh, the coil, the, the kids have a lot of sensors. They are mostly uh, under general anesthesia, uh, so they have to monitor their vital signs and they are put to sleep. And of course, if the kids are sick, which is the case for a kid that's having an MRI, they have to have this exam many, many times, sometimes multiple times during the week, which means that kids are going under anesthesia way more than they should. Um, so that was the motivation. This is, what, uh, this is what we wanted to fix, make MRI more comfortable, make MRI more accessible for kids, faster, and uh, take anesthesia away. Uh, from the MRI suite. Then came the dream. And I have to thank Mark Davis, who was a staff member in our um, department. Uh, some of you must remember Mark. Uh, wonderful guy. He designed this. He, he drew this for us. We explained to, to him what our project was, and he designed this for us. But this was the dream. If you, take a, if you have a baby, if you, you swaddle the baby, and the babies go to sleep. So our idea was, well, printing is used in graphic designs, in graphic t-shirts, so why don't we print the coil, print these antennas in a way that we can swaddle the baby, and the baby goes to sleep and goes into the MRI. <coughs> that was a dream. Uh, this was the picture that went in the first grant proposal. We said, um, t-shirts, um, are not one size fits all. If you go to a shop, you go and know exactly which t-shirt you should pick up for you, for your body. So we said, okay, let's print on t-shirts or um, onesies for, for babies. And then when the, the patient shows up in the MRI suite, as part of the preparation, it is, okay, my size of t-shirts is small. I take the t-shirt and I know that the MRI, all the coils will be fitting my body. And then when the Warriors player comes to have an MRI, he will say my, my t-shirt is extra, extra large and he gets coils that fit his, fits his body. So what my group was doing was printing. And as I explained to you my view of what, what Mickey's answer for the coil, what is a coil was, uh, translated into this, materials research. So um, <clears throat> we went and tried to optimize the conductor that could be printed and optimize the dielectric that would be between the conductor plates to make this capacitor. So first we looked at some materials as dielectrics that could be printed. And uh, we were mostly looking at how we can um, um, manipulate or, or control the, the ink composition in order to get the dielectric constant that would be tra then translated into a capacitance that uh, you needed for that capacitor. And we showed that, uh, well, we could, uh, we could do this uh, um, relatively well and we were happy enough to take that coil with those printed capacitors and start testing as coils. Um, later, we came up with uh, a brilliant idea, I think, so obvious after the fact, but not obvious then, that the substrates that we were using to print these coils are actually plastic films and therefore they are dielectrics. In printing, you can, uh, you can design all sorts of things with printing. So we then started using the substrate as the dielectric. 
where we print in one side of this plastic film um, um, one part of the coil, flip the substrate, and then print on the other side, and have now a dielectric that is quite reproducible because it's the thickness of the, the, the plastic film um, that you choose. Okay, how does printing looks like? Um, it looks like this, this is a screen printer. You have the design of the coil on top where the screen is. Uh, the substrate is underneath. The printer first spreads the, spreads the ink and then pushes the ink through that design and out comes the coil. So in terms of manufacturing and um, fabrication, this is highly scalable. You can change the design as, and then you change your screen, you change the design, you print very fast, goes with large area. So our dream was becoming a little bit more uh, closer to coming home because we, we had a method that was quite different from what other people were, were using that was scalable. So that dream of having this on clothing was possible. Then we go back and start talking to the coil engineers. Oh, brutal feedback. And, uh, and all they, they asked us was, what about the Q factor? What about the Q factor? What about the Q factor? So I'm going to show you the Q factor. Um, here's a video. So I'll be talking over the video. But what you're going to see is the following. We have one printed coil that has conventional electronics. So the really expensive capacitors are there. The conductor is copper, which is acceptable as a good conductor to most. And um, we are going to show how these coils, we are measuring Q factor here on the go, and showing you how these coils um, are actually used. And some of you I know uh, know a lot about antennas, and when you have the coil or an antenna in air, it behaves quite differently than when you put on the body. And it's all about how much energy is lost there, your Q factor. Well, when you put the coil close to the body, which is what you're supposed to do in the MRI setting, that means you are coupling the antenna to your body and now the losses in energy that you have there come from the body. So it's, um, they say, body dominance, uh, noise dominance. So the losses come from the body, not from the materials that you are using. So the Q factor that really matters should be the Q factor as uh, an antenna in MRI, which is coupled to the body. Okay, now I'm going to play the, the, the oops. Hold on. Okay, so here comes good materials, good old materials, Q factor 400, acceptable for most people. Comes our printed coil, Q factor of 85. Uh, now we start using these coils properly. So if you couple now the coil that had Q factor of 400 with one hand, that 400 goes down to 50. Put both hands, your Q factor now is 25. That's how it's used in MRI in the, uh, during imaging. So your Q factor is actually lower when it's coupled with the body. Comes our coils, couple with one hand, Q factor 35, couple 24. So essentially, they are the same. They will behave the same the moment they are coupled with the body, even though now the materials that you're using are much cheaper, much easier to deposit, scale, scalable, to make it even one day perhaps disposable. Okay, uh, but Q factor is not the only thing that matters for imaging because um, when you want to pick up these small signals um, from the spins in your, in your uh, body, you also want that antenna to be as close as possible to the body. And the current coils, they are actually almost, in some cases, almost five to 10 centimeters away from the body. Our coils, they're flexible, they're very thin. So we could actually put against the body. So when we, in the scanner, 
comparing apples to apples, have the printed coil with the super bad Q factor uh, close to the body, as opposed to the other coil that had Q factor of 400 away from the body, you see that the image of the flexible conformal coil is better quality than the other one. Of course, with the other one, you just acquire more, more data and eventually you get here. But here we were comparing the uh, apples to apples. Then we went further and looked at uh, how this relative signal to noise ratio uh, changes as you bring the coil away from the body. So what you see here, I will walk you through this, it's not too complicated. We have a phantom, we put the, the coil very close to the body, and uh, here's our control copper and ceramic capacitors, where, and then as you take the coil away from the body to, let's say here, 20 uh, millimeters, you see that you already lost uh, signal to noise ratio by 20%. You keep bringing it out uh, away from the body up to 50 millimeters, and you see that the SNR is down to 60% of the initial, okay? Real life, centimeters, not millimeters. Uh, now, take our, uh, our printed dielectric, which was the first uh, option that we had here. You start uh, uh, with lower SNR because the Q factor ratio uh, was lower. And once you take away from the body, um, that's 80%, uh, that's, um, oh, I was talking about, that 80% that you had here is equivalent uh, to the control coil once the control coil is almost 13 uh, millimeters away from the body. So if ours is going to stay close to the body and the control coils are going to be 10 centimeters away from the body, that is a win there. Um, same then for the, the plastic substrates as the dielectric layer. Now you see that uh, it was about 90%. The Q factor was better for, for the um, plastic substrate. But once uh, that the control coil is 18 millimeters away from the body, the flexible coil again performs better. So Q was not everything. Performance of uh, single materials or single devices is not everything. Once you put into the context of the application, this is what matters. Then, okay, we had printing, so we could scale this. And you, can, you have to print more than one coil in order to cover an, uh, an area. And you can see here that uh, with four coils, I'll show you, we could cover quite a lot of, uh, of the human body. When we got to this, to this uh, stage, after doing a lot of safety checks, we were able to start volunteer imaging. And with volunteer imaging here, we are comparing an eight channel, which means eight coils, eight antennas, uh, to a 12, 12 channel, um, a commercial coil. Now, you can't really see much of a difference here. Uh, today, I see some differences because I learned a little bit more, but you see that at the surface here, at the edge, uh, the signal of the printed coil was better. And inside, not um, that different. Uh, then, because of this flexibility and the ability of changing design, we could image all sorts of parts of the body that are very hard to image with uh, uh, rigid electronics, like the shoulders or the ankle, um, the, um, your arm with flexibility or not, or the knee. This knee picture was one of the first ones we got. This was one surprisingly amazing result that we got. And the spine. Um, so we got body coverage, we got uh, good volunteering um, images, and with our coils, one design, we did the job of all of these coils that are in the hospital was doing. Because uh, since they are so clanky and so big and archaic, um, you need the special ones. This one is for the foot. Uh, I think this one's for the knee, this one's for the head, uh, and you see ours is much more uh, pleasant looking. Okay, all of this, 
I have to say now, I have to use, uh, um, I have to name the other school. <coughs> All of this could not have been done without collaboration with Stanford because we didn't have a scanner at Berkeley. And as somebody was saying here at the panel, uh, if you're at Berkeley, you go get it, you go get it. So um, uh, we had this amazing person um, um, at Berkeley, who, uh, at Stanford, who opened his scanner to us and we did all of this development there. Well, he saw all this development. He's uh, the head of radiology at the Stanford Children's Hospital and he said, well, I would like to have some coils for my patients. So off we went again thinking about safety and we designed our first prototype for a, a patient. Um, we bought this doll for our students to get the scale that we were talking about. Um, since um, he never had the baby before, he didn't know. So he had baby hope and we designed this coil uh, for babies, newborn babies. Basically, we had two elements in the two coils in the front and two coils in the back. Um, this coil then was used at Stanford in a 10-week-old patient. You see that the 10-week-old was much bigger than baby Hope, but still uh, they used this coil uh, uh, on the baby. You can see here what I was talking before, uh, where there are all sorts of other sensors in the kids. I'm not happy about that either, but, um, and how the kids uh, have lots of blankets and all this stuff around is because they were expecting the other coil. And the way that they use the other coil, the conventional coil, is that they put blankets and pillows to offset the coil from the body so it doesn't collapse the lungs from the kids, from the weight. Okay, these are the types of pictures that we got. And then our feedback from the radiologist was, this was great, can I have a bigger one? And we talked to our students and of course to go from a design with two coils, two elements, to a design that you can fit other kids, it took a lot of work. That meant another year of PhD designing that. And our student, just fearless, said, Fine, let's do it. And uh, if you know Joe Correa, that's how he, you know, that's my impersonation of him, fearless. So we designed a, a second coil uh, that now had 12 channels, six on the top, six on the, on the back. Um, and uh, Stanford calls that coil the Berkeley 12. And I have the Berkeley, a part of the Berkeley 12 here. So. What's happened here? We have six coils, uh, six elements, so you can see the six elements um, are here. Uh, we went to Joanne's and got some bibs, uh, bib uh, fabric, um, and we made a coil for kids that uh, looked like this. And when it was set up uh, for patients, it looks as you can see in this picture. One of the nice things about this picture is the following. Because uh, doctors um, are concerned about collapsing the kid's lungs and also uh, for MRI, they want to correct for a motion artifact. There is a respiratory bellow here, a sensor that is monitoring respiration. When our coil showed up, the nurses didn't know what to do with the, with the respiratory bellow, so they put it on top of the coil. <laughs> Uh, because, of course, the coil doesn't have, um, you know, there's no risk of collapsing anyone's lungs with this. Uh, and you see the images, beautiful images. Um, then, what was the feedback from the doctor? <laughs> oh, this was great. Can I have another one with more elements? And we were like, okay, now. <laughs> uh, so that's when the, the, the story changes then. Then we start qu asking questions. Well, maybe we should have a business. The only way that the kids are going to have a coil that is designed for them is if we do it. And for Mickey and I, this was the number one motivation to start a company, was the kids need this. We have technology in our hands. If we let the student graduate and go and work at Google, uh, this will die and the kids will go back to whatever. So, 
okay, uh, we started thinking about what would the business do? How can we start a business? Uh, would people buy this? And uh, I enrolled with um, uh, Joe and uh, Balthazar, who, were, um, who was a postdoc in my group. We enrolled at the uh, NSF I Corps program. And there I was a student with them. This program is very intense. Um, you have to conduct um, interviews and you have to go traveling and meet people and learn how the business is done. Uh, so I, I worked with my students and that was amazing because that brought me to, brought all of us to the same level where I, I was not knowing more than they did and the dynamics started changing and that was very fundamental for us to, uh, to then go from student advisor uh, relationship to partners relationship. So um, we scaled this prototype and off we went uh, to learn the possibility of the business. Uh, this was the team, the iCorps team, myself, Joe, our PhD student, co-advised, Balthazar, uh, postdoc in my group, and Darren, who is now very involved with the Berkeley internship, and he was, he was not so much uh, in Berkeley back then, but he was our, uh, our industrial mentor. Every Saturday, we did homework in my kitchen. Um, there's a lot of homework from iCorps, so um, they would show up around 8.30, I fed everyone, and we worked until we were done with the homework, which was basically see what we learned during the week through the interviews, through the customer interviews that we did. The first homework we had was to build a business canvas. And this business canvas, you had to fill up these boxes. I was always a very good student. <laughs> So what did I do? I did what I knew how to do. I bought the book, I read, and I went full on on my homework. And, uh, and then this was what we did. Uh, so you see lots of words, lots of uh, things. Uh, we didn't really know how to build a, um, uh, a business proposition or this customer relations it was very difficult for us to come up with something that made sense, but okay, we did the homework. Then, I told you what the problem of, of MRI was from the research point of view. After we were done with this uh, program where we interviewed lots of people, this is what the problem of MRI <laughs> became. It became like this. If the patient, this is from the hospital point of view, the business point of view, if the patient can stay still, it's great. They make money. If the patient moves, the, the image is a fail. That means they cannot build insurance and they lose money. So for the hospital, it was, it's comfortable, it means money. Not comfortable, they lose money. And most MRI suites are loss, uh, loss centers in their budgets, in budgets of hospitals. They are not profit centers. We also had uh, to come up with an ecosystem. And to me, the radiologist, now you can see Shreyas here, our, our radiologist at Stanford. To us, all we knew, it was all about the radiologist. He opened all the doors for us. He made this work. He took risks to let us do our research. So he was really there in the middle as the angel of all of this. I still see him that way, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but our regional uh, ecosystem was really centered on the radiologist. Then we went to all sorts of places. We talked to technicians, we talked to patients, we talked to hospital uh, administrators. Uh, we traveled all around the, uh, the country uh, to learn how people do business and what's their pain points. So our second, uh, or our fine, uh, this is version two. Our version two of the canvas was all red line. You know when you turn on your best homework and the professor goes, Ch -ch -ch. well, that happens to us too. All wrong, all wrong. 
They said, no, no, this is, you don't know this, you don't know this, so how do you back this? So this is how it came back. The final one um, looked like this. So it was always like increased revenue, reduced cost, and all that dream of the research that we had uh, came into, of course, how to make money, how not to lose money, how to make my patients uh, happy so that I don't lose money. And, um, but then we had a much better view of the customer relationship. And that was the amazing thing to do during the I-Corps. So at the end, um, this panel of teachers that are all business uh, people, uh, they vote if uh, your idea is a go or no go. So we were a go. Uh, we actually got the, a prize for best team. Uh, why were we a go? because we had a clear customer segment. We knew exactly who we had to talk to in order to sell the product. Um, and our product was a need and not a like um, or nice to have. Uh, we had a value proposition and the value proposition is we will provide comfort so that you can make money instead of losing money. And we had a very clear um, sale strategy. Okay, then we incorporated. The company is called InK Space Imaging because the image is acquired in K Space. Because, ah, you, I knew you would like that, Eli. And because it's printed, so it's also ink. You have the ink there, so clever. Uh, very geeky. So, um, and uh, okay, so we formed uh, uh, videos and all of that to show the idea of the company. Um, <clears throat> the company has, of course, a mission and everything. Um, and uh, the slides look better. I left the slides as original. I didn't, so that you got a feeling of the, of the uh, journey. And where are we now? So we incorporated, found the company in 2017. In uh, December of 2021, um, we received the first FDA approval for a product for the children that looks like this, where we have still the lightweight, very nice design, definitely designed for a kid. Um, instead of 12 coils, uh, 12 channels, uh, Instead of six, as we had here, now we have 12. So our product is a 24-channel uh, coil array. You see here that the um, uh, cable traps um, to make this safer, and there is no, no currents going through the, the, the coil due to the magnetic field, are children friendly. <laughs> and um, yeah, so this FDA approval for sale. Uh, we have sold some already. Uh, and um, the most annoying part of it is the cable. We are going to get rid of it. Yes, no cable anymore. Uh, then uh, we modified the gravures here and, uh, um, to make it adult-like, and we also got uh, approval for adult use in uh, 2022. So I thought I would not talk about the company uh, just uh, talk about the journey, since that's, um, that's a very relevant thing here, and, um, and, and, and really share the story that if I hadn't come here 12 years ago, uh, this wouldn't have happened, uh, because it was really the fact that I met someone who was willing to talk to me about research, and we came up with a completely different idea um, of research that could only have been done uh, here because the overlap of, uh, of expertise was here. Uh, this is how the product looked like. The company is good company, real company uh, with marketing and all of this. You see how beautiful the pictures look like. This is the coil that we have now for, for children. And um, if you want to know, learn more about the company, I am happy to uh, be the vehicle. So I'll stop here with acknowledgments of um, uh, acknowledging again Shreyas um, 
without him and without collaboration between the two schools, this would not have happened. Um, Fraser from GE also helped us enormously. He also helped us get a scanner for Berkeley. So now our students now don't, don't need to drive to Stanford to test their coils. They have a scanner here. That makes a huge difference and accelerates the progress of the research, of course. We were funded by GE, by NIH, by iCorps, by Barbara Baker, and Skydeck also was the first uh, funding uh, that we got um, for the company, Skydeck. So thank you so much. I'm happy to answer questions.